Well, good morning, Guillermo. Thank you so much for being with me here today. I am so sure. excited, and I hear it's your birthday today, actually, April 5th here. <laughs> it, is, it is. Well, I couldn't think of a better way to spending it than spending it with you. So. Oh, you're too kind. Well, we're lucky. We're lucky to have this moment with you and ask you a few questions about this exciting upcoming season, especially excited about it after not being able to have one last summer. Oh, God, yes. And... Um, and we've reimagined so many of our concerts and events. It's going to be a, a different season than we've ever had before. And we're going to be in some exciting new venues, um, some new formats, um, bringing in food and drink um, to sort of support and highlight the music. But of course, the music is always going to be the centerpiece of all of our events. Uh, but I do think it might attract a newer uh, audience. And I'm excited to introduce classical music and music in the mountains to some new people. So I thought it might be worthwhile to pick your brain about um, some stuff that maybe our core supporters already know, uh, but some of our newer patrons may be interested to learn. Um, and so, as you know, since you've been conducting with us since 2007, a lot of our patrons are already familiar with you and your family's legacy, but I just think it's such um, an amazing story. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about you and your family and that legacy. I'd be happy to, but first I have to tell the amazing story of how you and the board and all our supporters have made a, obviously a very conscious decision to keep music in the mountains going through through the non-season of last summer and to have and to see the enthusiasm and the new ideas that are brought forth i mean that's a story upon itself and and uh, you deserve it. most of the credit for that because you've been you've been tenacious you've come up with new ideas you have been very receptive to all the things that we have promoted and uh, it could not be done Without, without you and, and the board and everybody that has put in an effort. So uh, it will be amazing if, if more ways I want to resume music and to, to bring back, because I feel like we are giving back for what you have done to support us throughout this, this very dark time. And now it's our turn to, to thank you for, for all that. So that's wow. it. Well, it's been a wonderful team effort. I definitely can't take the credit, but I'm really proud to be part of it, and I've never been more excited about a season than I am for the 2021, I'll tell you that. All right. So, yeah, thank you. So um, my story is, is it's not that complicated. I'm from Puerto Rico originally. I, um, I come from a very large musical family. Unfortunately, not many of them are left anymore, but uh, in my own generation, at least there's four professional musicians left in my generation. And I, I went to New York when, uh, to study at the Juilliard School. Um, I was involved in a lot of chamber music. I, with the Orpheus Chamber Orchestra, I was, um, was a founding member of that. Um, I joined the New York City Ballet in the 90s as concertmaster, spent 10 years there. Um, then I got interested in conducting, and I've been conducting for the last almost, gee, almost 40 years now. Um, and uh, I was with the New Mexico Symphony, um, and now the Santa Fe Symphony, and previously the Puerto Rico Symphony. Um, but I'll never forget the uh, moment that um, I was asked to come and be a guest conductor at Music in the Mountains in 2007, as what I realized was my audition to, for, for the job. And thankfully, you guys thought enough of me to pick me as your uh, music director, and uh, I can't believe it's 14 years. It's going to be 14 I know. years. Time flies. I know. It's fantastic. But, um, you know, it's it, it, all, it still feels very new to me. I cannot wait to get up to Durango and see all of you, make music with all of you. The, uh, uh, the musicians that have been put together are absolutely extraordinary. Um, Greg Hughes put together a, a, an orchestra of my dreams, I always say. <laughs> and uh, they come together for very little compensation, but, but for absolute love of music. And we play great, great, great concerts that are worthy of any, any music festival in the world. So. It's true. We're very blessed to have this level of talent in 
our little rural community here in Durango, Colorado. And, and uh, you know, I've talked to the musicians and I know why they come. It's because of you. And they love to, they absolutely love to play for you, Maestro. And they tell me that. Um, they also love to come for Durango. Durango is a special place and I think everyone enjoys it. It's like a family reunion every year for them. But uh, yeah, no, you actually are the leader of the band, very literally. So, <laughs> so um, you can't lead very well unless you have very good troops. And that I am blessed with in, in, in this particular festival. Yeah. That's great. That's great. So what's the pandemic been like for you as a conductor? I mean, your, your whole existence is about performing and gathering people and, and then the pandemic happened. So how, what have you been up to? Oh, it's been, it's been terrible. <laughs> it's been terrible. I just played my, uh, with the Santa Fe symphony, we've been doing uh, videos because it's the only thing we can do of very small groups, uh, which have been very successful. And I just played my first chamber music performance in, a year and two months. Oh, wow. And that was the very first thing I haven't conducted in a year and two months. Um, I will conduct next in a couple of weeks when I get an engagement with the Buffalo Philharmonic. That will be the first in a year and three months. It's in, But I decided early on into, in the pandemic when I realized I was going to be in, in Albuquerque and not leave for a long time, and uh, doing, thank goodness, doing all my teaching on online. I teach at Lynn University in Florida. Um, I can do violin students online, and that's worked out very well. So that's what was in the problem. But all the time being home with time to spare. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> it's, it's a time to all of these things that I've always wanted to do. Of course, I'm a very a single-minded person it's all about music yes. you know i didn't decide course, to uh, a renovate house project or anything like that no no i don't do that but i did go through the entire ring cycle of wagner three times to learn it because i never really knew it before oh, wow. i went through all the 32 piano sonatas of beethoven because i'm not a pianist i've never played them but they are the body of the some of the greatest music ever written so it's okay this is my chance to do this. I've never done this. And, uh, and and in that way, it was really, really refreshing. I went through about 10 different Shakespeare plays, reading and watching on films. Things that you like and love, but you never have time to do. So in that way, um, I was never bored. I was I was I actually had a, a great time. I missed the performing terribly, of course. But uh, that was really a wonderful, a wonderful experience, and and a little bit of a rejuvenating thing to do things that you, that are related to your music, but that you, never done. So, right. wow, yeah. and it'll just make you even better. That's amazing. I don't know about that, but, <laughs> but it was fun. I think we're all trying to grow all the time. So yeah. Um, okay. Next question. Uh, what are you most looking forward to about this summer's festival? Live music. <laughs> Just yeah, live music yeah. to be able to raise my hand, go like that, and have the sound come on me right there, not from a speaker, not from a Zoom screen, uh, just yeah. live, the, the live music. And um, I am so thrilled that um, thanks to your initiative, we are, whatever happens with the pandemic between now and then, we are sure that we're going to have some music because of that wonderful mobile stage that you have a uh, commission and that it's been, I, is it still being built for us or is it ready? Yeah, it, um, I'm not sure exactly when it'll be delivered, but it's, it's um, being framed, I think at this time. So uh -huh. all the hydraulics are in and I've been getting little pictures and I'm so excited. And I think it'll be a wonderful tool for us, not just this year, but for years to come. I can't just wait to set up in the middle of main street and give a concert right there. Just <laughs> whoever wants to come. I mean, it will, I think it will be so, so fantastic. So because of that, we're sure that some music will, will happen. I, I'm still keeping my fingers crossed that um, there will be enough vaccines and there'll be enough uh, easing of regulations that we can have the orchestra concert. So um, 
Uh, well, Guillermo, I, I can tell you that if, if we were going to um, basically open the curtains today, April 5th, we would be able to have those orchestral performances. It, um, it The audience would be much smaller than I think it will be in July. And we're going to release seats as we um, get closer and closer to the event, because right now we're a little bit restricted on audience size. But um, but as of today, I, I believe that we could be inside the concert hall. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So I think I think things are going to be just even with all the even with all the wind players blowing and, and stuff. Well, okay, don't quote me on that. Maybe this since this is recorded, you guys don't quote me on that. But I think we could be fine. <laughs> right, great. Right. Yeah, I mean a lot of orchestras are doing it. So I'm not, you know, I'm not uh yeah that worried about it. And uh yeah. we do have a lot of members of our wind section coming from the Dallas Symphony and they and they've been playing a lot. A lot of concerts already in their own hole in Dallas, so I'm sure they're used to I it. I think there are ways, and and don't ask me all those specific ways, but I just know that by the time July happens, things are going to be so much better. I was looking in the paper today, and 41% of La Plata County has been vaccinated so far, so we're on our way. That's so, great. great. Yeah, I hate that that's the conversation we always have to have. It's so top of mind, but hey, it's a pandemic. You know, yeah. It's a generation, so... Um, are there any specific programs, though, or pieces that you have planned for the summer that you are especially excited about? Yes, and and they happen to the the two that are, <laughs> strangely enough, the two uh, uh, we're doing a lot of great mainstream repertoire and a lot a, a lot more chamber music than we've done in the past because the first week will be concentrated on that as opposed to previous years because of the pandemic will be a smaller group in the first week. So it it's wonderful. I'm, I'm going to get to play a ton of chamber music and great masterpieces like Schumann Piano Quintet and the Dvorak Tercero and, and the Dvorak Quintet with bass, uh, which is a fantastic piece. But I'm actually looking forward the most, believe it or not, to the family concert. Really? Yes, because there's two pieces that are just absolutely fabulous and delightful. One is the uh, the Toy Symphony, which is a, a tribute, attributed variously to either Leopold Mozart, Mozart's father wrote it, or Joseph Haydn wrote it, or Michael Haydn wrote it. Nobody really knows exactly for sure up to this date. It's mostly attributed to Leopold Mozart, but... Who knows? It doesn't matter. It's a piece designed for uh, for kids because it incorporates uh, eight different toy instruments, rattles and kazoos and recorders and all sorts of stuff that make it so attractive for the kids. Uh, um, but it's a class, a beautiful classical symphony with but with all of that noise going on. So it's really going to be a lot of fun. Oh, and in that same concert, we're playing a piece that I just think is magnificent. It's called Tyrannosaurus Sue by composer Bruce Adolph. It's a piece that he designed for children. Um, there's a very famous, um, almost complete full skeleton of a Tyrannosaurus in the museum in Chicago, Museum of Fine Arts of, of Natural History in Chicago, uh, called Sue. They, they decided to call that, that uh, dinosaur Sue for some reason. So Bruce invents a whole story about that this Tyrannosaurus from the moment he's a baby baby dinosaur to growing up to falling in love to unfortunately then dying at the end when the when the uh, the uh, dinosaurs are extinct. But it's a wonderful opportunity to and there are many other different types of dinosaurs that come. All of them represented by different instruments. Or the orchestra, kind of like a, it's a modern day Peter and the Wolf, so to speak, <laughs> um, in, in in that in that kind of a vein, and uh, with wonderful uh, narration written by Bruce, which I will deliver uh, and conduct. Uh, so it's just a really magnificent piece, and I think um, I hope that everybody will 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 love it. So. And it's an it's an orchestral piece, right? Yes. Well, it, yes, an orchestral piece with uh, mostly solo instruments, but it, it will be at least 15 players uh, playing in that piece. Wow. I can't wait for that. That's going to be neat. Um, 
So for people who don't know, and I certainly didn't really understand all of this before I started working here, um, what's like the difference between orchestral music and chamber music? Well, chamber music is small, smaller. <laughs> you use typically um, single instruments on a part. Is a string quartet to violins, viola, cello, or whatever, uh, or you add a piano or uh, single instruments. And the idea of chamber music is that um, the great composer structured chamber music as an intimate conversation between the players. You play with each other. There's no conductor. You rely on the on visual and oral cues, um, and the lines are almost always written in a way to have that kind of interaction. It, it's akin to a, a lively conversation between, between participants. Not that that doesn't happen in orchestral music, but in orchestral music, um, obviously you have big sections. You, you may have 10 violins. Um, everybody can just speak whatever the heck they want. They have to, they have to speak at a certain time and in a group and, and, you know, with things more determined. So, um, and typically it, it mostly requires a conductor to, uh, put all those conversations and all those arguments, musical arguments in line so that they fall in the right place and everything like that. So, uh, that's, that's really the main difference. The more, <clears throat> individual approach or the more the group approach both are perfectly conducive to making extraordinary music but they're very different in approach. they are very different yeah. and i you know what i have come to learn too is that the you know the real classical music lovers prefer the chamber music somehow i think that intimate experience um mm -hmm. is, is um something really special so, yeah, but on the other hand, fun. there's nothing like standing in front of a huge orchestra and have that sound come yeah. at you. Like, like I mean, <laughs> that's 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 incomparable. So, well, that's true, especially when the acoustics are good, like they are in the concert hall. <laughs> yeah. But we are going to be doing a lot of chamber music this year, yeah. and um, and I'm excited to hear you talk to the audience from the stage about what to listen for. Um, you know, we'll, we'll learn, I think, a lot more in that intimate setting than, than maybe we sometimes do in the concert hall with the full yes. orchestra. Yeah. So how do musicians that, you know, come together for such a short period of time every summer in Durango and they don't play together any other time of year, how do they come together and, and, um, and do so well <laughs> with such a short amount of rehearsal time? It has to do um, with preparation. It has to do with respect, mostly. A huge amount of respect. And um, I give Greg Hughes a lot of credit for that because he, he has picked um, the right people, um, people that they know. It, the musicians know that they're going to come here and they're going to be playing with other extraordinary musicians. Nobody wants to look bad. Nobody wants to sound bad. Um, everybody comes prepared. We usually typically have only two rehearsals for a major repertoire orchestral concert. In a normal orchestral setting of a major symphony, you may have four or five. Here we only do two. But they, everybody, nobody comes here to learn their part then. Right. It's done beforehand. And uh, that's the only way that uh, it can happen because of their love for music, but the respect that they have for their fellow colleagues and knowing that because our orchestras are basically fairly small, you can't, everybody has to play. When you only have seven violins, if one of them doesn't play. You're in big trouble. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, uh, respect professionalism and love of music that's the only way it happens wow that's great and so fun to be part of something like that yeah okay so let's get to the meat of it can you walk us through the programs that we're going to be doing this year yes of course um i actually had them up on my screen here let me see if i can find them so i can i know what i'm talking about 
Uh, as we said, the first week is uh, entirely devoted to chamber music. Um, and some great, great pieces are going to be uh, done. Um, uh, the first concert is the Dvorak Tercero for two islands and viola, a lovely piece. Uh, if you can imagine a, a string quartet, but but somehow the cellist got sick and decided to stay home. <laughs> <laughs> And the other three have to play. Uh, I, I have a feeling that that's kind of like the thing that the Vorjak was thinking, um, but but it's structured so well that all the three voices form a complete whole. With the viola in this case being the lowest instrument, naturally assuming a lot of the bass note roles that the cello would have had. But you would never know when you hear this piece that any instrument would be missing. It's absolutely glorious and lovely to play. And then in the same program, we have one of the great classics of chamber music, uh, the, qu the Piano Quintet by Schumann. Um, this is uh, the first of the great piano quintets in, in history, really. And it was the inspiration for the ones that followed by Dvorak, Brahms, Shostakovich. But the Schumanns kind of set the tone as a classic ensemble of the, the, the string quartet and the, and the king of instruments the piano. So um, I'm very much looking forward for, for, forward to that. In the second concert, um, we have a Czech composer, Bohuslav Martinu, with uh, uh, two, uh, madrigals for violin and viola, which I uh, can't wait to play with Emma, our uh, fabulous concertmaster. She on violin and I will be on viola. Um, I had played that piece actually earlier uh, in music in the months about four or five years ago when Nick Ujelmi was here, we did it at a house concert. And at that time I played violin and he played viola. So now I'm reverse. I'm gonna play viola on the on the same piece. Fun. And, um, then we have the Schubert, uh, a short but lovely trio by Schubert. A little bit of the same case as the Vorjak Torsetto. It's like a string quartet, but the sec in this case, the second violin decided to stay home. So it's huh. just one violin, viola and cello but uh, absolutely lovely piece. Uh, I don't know why he only wrote one movement. It's almost like he just got tired of it and decided not to continue, but we have that one movement and that's all that we need. Uh, the Dvorak String Quintet, it's a bit of a rarity because there are many great string quintets in history, usually with an, an extra viola or in the case of Schubert with an extra cello, but this one has a string, a bass, a double bass. So it's your basic string quartet with a bass added. So imagine that gives that huge depth of sound. It's like uh, like you're listening in your car, but all of a sudden you turn on the subwoofer, you yeah. know, and the bass <laughs> sound comes on. Uh, uh, it's fantastic. So it gives the Vorjak an opportunity to get almost orchestral sonorities out of this, <coughs> excuse me, out of this string quintet. Um, and then in the following concert, um, uh, Emma and Erin will play Bartok violin duets. Those are some of the most amazing pieces. Bartok mm -hmm. wrote these duets, really intending them to be um, uh, teaching material for young students so that they learn uh, more uh, advanced har harmonies and and a more uh, contemporary musical language, but they work perfectly in concert as well. They're always very short, so it says here 15 minutes. So they're probably going to play 10 of them at least because they're they're very short and with very descriptive names. Absolutely gorgeous uh, pieces. Then we will have a uh, Mozart string divertimento, um, which is often played by an orchestral group, but perfectly adapted for solo strings. Um, classic Mozart, early Mozart, but absolutely beautiful, uh, beautiful music. I am sorry to say that I do not know the Dring Trio for Flute of One Piano, but if uh, they have picked it, I'm sure it's gonna be a great piece. I'm, I'm not entirely familiar with that. Um, in the third concert of chamber music, uh, we have another one of the great, great, great classics, which is the Quintet for Piano and Winds by Mozart. This is mature, mature Mozart uh, later in his life. And uh, he had a special fondness for the wind 
compliment. Um, when you hear a lot of his piano concertos, for instance, um, the strings in the orchestra almost play a total secondary role. He's often piano in great dialogues and interactions with the wind instruments. And uh, here, he does that perfectly here. He totally disposes of the strings and he's just piano and wins in, in some of the greatest music that Mozart ever wrote. Um, after that, we have a, a big selection of uh, pieces for the brass ensemble that they get, they get a, a, a chance to shine. Uh, the brass ensemble is, the brass quintet is one of the most amazing groupings too because it has that fantastic sound and, and huge amount of volume and, and brilliance that they can produce. And I see that they are doing a huge arrangement of uh, different styles, including some popular music. Uh, we left it up to them for to decide what pieces they were going to choose. Uh, they know their repertoire better than me, so uh, neither Greg nor I, were, nor I were involved in that process, but they, I'm sure it's going to be a, absolutely fantastic. So that's that's it in a nutshell for the uh, chamber music um, compliment. Uh, should I continue with the next week or anything you want to add at this point? Well, I mean, I love hearing all of this from you, and I'd, I'd love to hear the rest of the programming, too. Okay. Okay, well, I already talked about the uh, family concert with the Toy Symphony and the Tyrannosaurus Zoo. Um, then uh, in the first, in what it looks like it's gonna be the real first uh, or fully orchestral concert of the, of the season, we have a, a lovely Haydn Symphony, number 77 in B flat 77 out of the 104 that he wrote. That's a lot of symphonies. Actually, you know that we say Haydn wrote 104 symphonies, but the fact is there was a very famous fire at the Esterhazy Palace where he worked for, for, for the Count Esterhazy, who was his patron. And then he speculated that a huge amount of the musical library was lost in the, in the fire. So he may have written 200 symphonies for all we know. <laughs> but but there are 104 that survive, which is still more than most most composers. <clears throat> 77 in B flat is a lovely, uh, brilliant, a very cheery work. And then that concert will conclude with the suite from the ballet Pulcinella by Igor Stravinsky. This is one of the most uh, felicitous pieces that he wrote. He takes music uh, derived from Baroque composer Pergolesi, and he rearranges it in different styles with, of course, with the 20th century sound and those, those characteristic qualities of, of Stravinsky's music. Uh, it's like, like, it's like, it's almost like adding some green chili to, to, to bland food. <laughs> That's what he does in this, <laughs> in this, in this suite. Yeah. Um, and speaking of green chili, we have the Bach and Burritos concert. <laughs> yes. I'm very excited about it. Yeah. Um, where is this concert, by the way? Um, I, I'm not seeing it in the program that I have in front of me. It's at a really neat venue called Riverbend Ranch. Uh -huh. And it's like in the Hermosa Valley on your way up to Purgatory. Um, oh, yeah. 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 This is kind of like what, what our traditional St. Columba concert would have been, mostly Baroque music and mostly strings. <clears throat> so we tailored it that way, except... It's not all Baroque. We always had something else. We'll begin with with um, uh, the uh, very famous Eine Kleine Nachtmusik of Mozart, which is a divertimento that he gave that very fancy title, A Little Night Music. And uh, most everybody will recognize the opening bars that is one of the most famous uh, strains of music that in history. Um, then uh, the another classic, the Bach Concerto in D minor for two violins, and it will be played by, by our concert master and co-concert master, Emma and Aaron. I'm look, really looking forward for, to that. And we will have a, a work by a dear friend of mine, Puerto Rican composer, Ernesto Cordero. It would have been a premiere last year <laughs> that was, we were planning 
but since then the piece has been played elsewhere but it's still a absolutely lovely piece very short actually it's only about four minutes long but uh, it, it's very romantic, very uh, beautiful. It's called Añoranza, which means yearning. And it has that, that kind of a feel. Yearning, uh, back last year, it, I, he gave the title because we were in the thick of the pandemic and, and it's a way of expressing the yearning for the music and the concerts that we have lost, a yearning for the return to normal. So, um, which is still very applicable uh, this year. And uh, the concert will finish with the first of the three, uh, well, it says suite number three here, I think is number one, I'm not quite sure, it doesn't matter. There are three suites of water music by Handel and we're gonna play the one in F major. Um, people sometimes wonder why it was called water music. Um, Handel was a favorite of, of King George of England uh, as a composer. And uh, he often commissioned music from Handel. And once King George was having this party in this huge barge that were going down the Thames River, and he wanted music for that party. So one of the barges right behind the king had a whole orchestra of musicians assembled playing the music that Handel wrote for that occasion, thus water music. So, and he has become one of the great staples of, of, the, of the repertoire. Very, very wonderful and famous work. And finally, we get to week three when we gather the complete forces of the full-size orchestra with some uh, mainstream and fantastic music. Uh, in the first concert, we'll feature our uh, wonderful clarinet uh, player James Shields playing the great Mozart clarinet concerto. This is one of the last works that Mozart ever wrote. Late in his life, he came across uh, a very famous clarinet player and Mozart absolutely fell in love with the instrument and started using it in every piece that he wrote. And uh, the, the climax of that uh, love affair with the clarinet is this great concerto that we will hear uh, in this concert. And that will all be followed by another classic, the New World Symphony by Antonin Dvorak. Um, it's actually his symphony number nine called the New World because he wrote it when he was in America. He came to uh, the United States to be a teacher at what was called then the New York Conservatory of Music. And he wrote it during his stay in the United States, as well as the string quartet called the American Quartet. Those are the two famous works that were a result of his stay uh, in the United States. And for our final concert, um, we'll start with the great Egmont Overture of Beethoven. And then we have a commissioned work, a world premiere for uh, Durango uh, by composer Nan Schwartz. And I'm really, really looking forward to that. Uh, uh, it's a brilliant work, and I think it's going to be really exciting. And our audience will get a chance to hear a piece of music performed for the very first time ever. So I always think about that because you audiences are generally fairly conservative. They want to hear their great classics, and often don't want to hear newer music. But if we think that the New World Symphony was heard for the first time sometime, right. I cool had no be? idea what they were going to hear. The clarinet concerto of Mozart, somebody had to play the first time and the audiences didn't know what they were going to get. So if um, music is approaching that way, I think it's so exciting. There's, to me, there's very few things as exciting in classical music as the premiering of a new piece because who knows 200 years from now they may say oh they play the first time this great masterpieces or the work may be forgotten forever you you just don't know and that's well, and this is actually even more special because it's not just that we're playing it for the first time it's also that we actually had it written specifically for us as a as a 
celebration of coming back. Uh, it's called Tone Poem of Triumph, as you said, and and it's a triumphant return to the stage. And so, yes, I feel like uh, the work could potentially be one of those in 200 years that they're talking about, but it was originated with us. And I love that. And we're going to well, celebrate the community. Fantastic. Will the composer join us at that time? Will she, yes, she... Nan will be here. Nan Schwartz will be here. She was actually a recommendation to us when we wanted to do this commissioned piece um, by Richard Kaufman, who's a pops conductor that we've had as a guest conductor many times. Um, so they are friends and she's um, she is a composer more in the pops lane. And so this music will be, I think, more pops popular kind of music. And I just think it's going to be fun and it's going to it's going to be like the story of the struggle um, and then to the eventual triumph. And uh, boy, is that going to resonate? We've all struggled and we're kind yeah. of coming out of this fog. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Well, well, Guillermo, I just uh, appreciate you so much spending this time and talking to me about all of the wonderful programs that you and Greg put together. It's going to be an exciting season. Yeah, I think so. It's it. it, it I I feel like it doesn't even matter what we play. It's going to be so exciting. Just yeah, to, just I know. Be, yeah. And I'm also really looking forward to, you know, gathering the audience together and the musicians in these chamber um, intimate venues, these these neat new sort of hybrid indoor outdoor venues where people can connect um, safely, <laughs> put together the musicians in the audience. So fantastic. Yeah. I All can. right. Is there anything else that you want us to know or you'd like to say? No, please come join us this summer. I mean, just lot. There's nothing like live music, nothing like that, and uh, uh, one of the best places to ever experience it is right there in Durango at yeah. our Thank festival. You. So. Well, I can't wait to see you this summer. Thank you again, Guillermo. Thank you. Talk to you later.